Today I wanted to do a quick overview of the Mr. FPGA. What you're seeing here is the required DE10 nano board sandwiched in between three optional add-ons. All comfortably housed in an inexpensive acrylic case I got off of Etsy because I am deathly afraid of static electricity destroying this thing. But I'll go over each part of it individually. First off, what is FPGA? Fake plastic Gucci accessory? Francis Picabia's gorgeous art? Female Performer Grammy Award? <sighs> it stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And in the simplest terms, it's a chip that can mimic original hardware on the fly. With painstaking reverse engineering, every chip, every trace, and every logic element can be documented and flashed onto the FPGA, resulting in highly accurate recreations. FPGA promises a high level of accuracy and extremely low latency. The main component of this setup is the DE10 Nano Kit by Terasic, which is a small hobby computer with Intel's System on the Chip FPGA as its main selling point. It also has your usual ARM-based processor, HDMI output, Ethernet port, 1GB DDR3 SD RAM, and a micro SD card socket. This is technically all you really need to dive in, although you'll be locked out of several cores. To really experience all that the Mr. Project has to offer, you'll definitely want to get the 128MB SD RAM add-on, which plugs into the board quite easily. Your USB port needs will likely exceed what the DE10 has to offer on the main board. You could use any powered USB hub, but with the USB hub card that attaches neatly to the bottom of your DE10 Nano, you will have a cleaner and more convenient presentation. And since it requires separate power, it comes packaged with a DC splitter that also adds a handy switch since the Nano doesn't have one of its own. If you want to eliminate the already low latency and strive for analog accuracy, you'll want the I.O. board. It adds a 3.5mm analog audio and VGA video outputs. Even without the analog, it's still good to have since it adds a heat sink and a fan, a must if you're casing the unit, as well as three buttons and three status LEDs. There are other add-ons like a real-time clock, cassette interface, even a jammer adapter can be implemented. But what you see here is the most common setup. While you could buy each piece separately, some vendors offer the option of buying them all together pre-assembled for an extra cost. This is what I went with only because a couple of the boards individually were out of stock and I was impatient. But enough introduction. Let me hook this up to my monitor and give you a little tour. But fair warning, we're going in unscripted. Okay, what you're seeing here is the Mr. Device. I'm going to go ahead and plug the sockets in and the HDMI. We're going to hook up this uh, temporary keyboard here. We don't really need this for everyday play, but I want to do some setup with you guys. Also, since we're going to be doing some updates, I went ahead and I have this network cable. I'm going to just plug it in. This is switching back here. It's coming to life. Okay, so as you can see here, the first thing you'll notice is that you could change the background. So this is the default one, the analog snow, but uh, you could add your own images. Uh, you could have a nice little color bar set up here. You could uh, just different color bars and different variations. There's a nice gradient of colors if you are so inclined to enjoy that and just a black background if you're just bored with everything else. As you can see, the screen turns off if you don't do anything for a while, but any button brings it right back. Press escape, we have the system settings. So let's define joystick buttons and it's gonna determine what you're pressing by doing a D-pad test. So it's hooked up by Bluetooth, so press right. Stick one, tilt right, stick one, tilt down, stick two, tilt right, tilt down, and then you just map the buttons from here, right, left, down, up. This one's easy because it matches the actual layout of a Super Nintendo controller, so you know they have Super Nintendo in mind when designing this menu. Select, start. If there's any button you don't want to use, you could just hit uh, undefined by hitting space. There's a user button on the I.O. board you could also use. But I'll use the space bar since I have the keyboard out. Undefined, 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 undefined. Bump, bump, bump. Now you can make a menu button here. Uh, I actually have extra buttons on this controller, so I can make a separate menu button. However, if you want to use a joystick combination for two buttons, then you could do it that way too. And then to hit OK, uh, we'll make B OK and A back. Tilt the analog right, tilt the an Y down. And that's it, it's mapped. And now you can see I could actually use the menu here with the, the gamepad. 
Now, one of the great things about the Mr. Device and the Mr. Project in general is that they add a lot of scripts that help you do a lot of things a lot more quickly. The initial setup comes with uh, some pre-installed scripts. So my favorite script, which you have to download separately, is called Update All. It comes, when you set this up, it comes with Update, but Update All does everything and it's, and it's almost like a hands-off experience. So let me give you a little demonstration of Update All. Hit and enter. So let me go, to, I'm gonna press up to enter the settings screen. Okay, so what Update All does is pretty much everything that you would need to do for maintenance uh, on the system, because it updates quite frequently and you're gonna see a good update that's gonna come in. This is the updater doing its thing. You're gonna see, I'm not gonna show you the whole sequence because this will take a good maybe five minutes. Atari Lynx, this is, this is the new one that just came out as of the filming of this video, so. I actually went ahead and downloaded some legally obtained Lynx ROMs, and I'm going to show you how that works. Now, see, that's that's a lovely little bit of uh, Ashki art. Okay, it's going through all the BIOS. This is okay. Now we're doing Main Getter. This is this takes a few minutes because it's going to go through and see if you have every single ROM you might need, and it is done. All right. So let's go through utilities first. Uh, this is just a couple of tests, input test and SD RAM test. There's of course the arcade, we'll go over those in a second. There's computer cores and console cores. Um, I described before LL API. Uh, the APIs, these are for the, uh, the Bliss box that just came out. It lets you use official controllers, like old controllers for your Atari, your ColecoVision, your uh, Nintendo Entertainment System, etc. Other is, the installed games here, uh, these actually come with your initial setup. And there you go. I never actually played Flappy Bird on the uh, iOS or Android or whatever it was for because I just didn't care. When you want to change your cores, you have to go to Core. And uh, there's more. Let's go with Tomy Scramble. This is the Tomytronic. This is an, uh, a recreation of the Tomytronic VFD game Scramble, which is based on the arcade game Scramble. As you can see here, you could define buttons. So right, left, down, up, A, B, X, Y. I don't know how many buttons this thing has, but okay. Oh, cause I have to load the ROM. <laughs> right, turn down the volume here. Okay. Um. And there you have Tommy Tron. This is actually a very well done simulation of the old VFD game. We're not going to play this forever though, because we got to move on to more pressing matters. Let's see what we have in the console. So as of now, we have well, I'll let you count. You got the 2600, 5200 links. No 7800 yet, honestly. No on television yet either. You have the Odyssey 2 or Video Pack, uh, NES, Sega CD, Turbo Duo, and Vectrex. So this is actually new to the Lynx, so we're gonna try this out. And uh, let's define the Atari Lynx buttons, which I like to do for every new core I start running. Right, left, down, up, A, B, option, uh, we'll make X, option two, pause will be start, fast forward, we'll make one of the, the um... okay, this has a save state, this is new, but let's try out Ninja Gaiden. I remember I used to love this, I still actually do have it, Oh, this definitely looks like an Atari Lynx. Let's see if we can't change the screen a little bit. We have actually other options for filtering. As you can see here, there's a ton of effects here. You have uh, you have an LCD effect, which adds a little blockage to it, a little blur. Um, integer, integer scaling effects. You could really go down the rabbit hole of filters. There's just so many. We're gonna turn that all off though because it's just making it a mess. Let's see. Yeah, okay. You see that makes it a little bit smaller, so this way it doesn't look as harsh. There used to be a grab button, and I don't remember what it what it is. Oh yeah, okay. Option one is the grab button. There we go. Walk into my legs, sir. I keep turning off the music. That's not the game's fault. That's my fault. 
Okay, as much as I love this, let's try a different game just to, to get a better feeling of this. Okay, so as you see here, it's vertical. So what I'm going to do is I could actually turn the monitor around, but I really don't feel like doing that right now. So what I'm just going to do is change my options here. Oops. Oh, yes, you can. You got to turn off 240 mode. Okay. There it goes. Give me that applause. Okay, the Neo Geo Core is is quite um, is quite good because I don't know what's go the hell's going on here. You can change it between console and arcade. So if you want to play the arcade version of the of the of the DM game, you just choose MVS and console. You choose AES. Still don't know what the hell's going on here. Let's do Windjammers. Okay, it uses the Universal BIOS, and this is going to be the MVS version. Now, if you want to change it to the console version, let's do that. Yep, you see, it's uh, this, now it's the console version, and you could actually change it. That's how you win it. That's how you do it. Okay, let's go through the arcade ROMs here. So you'll see um, a whole bunch of different, you have a few hundred arcade games here and that's not including the Neo Geos. Now, if you're familiar at all with MAME, you know there's alternate versions of ROMs. So like there's an American version. So there's an alternatives folder. So for example, there's the upright alternate of Discotron. Final Fight has a whole bunch of different versions like the USA versions, Anniversary Edition. Let's try a game here. Let's try Disc Citron. I like to put a little bit of a filter on there just to kind of kill the harshness of the uh, upscaling. We want to define buttons right, left, down, up. Toss is A, deflect is B, aim up. I'll do uh, X and Y to aim down. Rotate will be the shoulder buttons. This actually works out pretty good with the shoulder buttons. Well, maybe not. This thing's a, this works better with a uh, with a knobby knob, a pull, push pull knob to be exact, because this actually has an up and down motion as well. You f you, you get used to it after a while. Du -du -du -du. Let's move on to a different game. Let's go to um, let's do UN Squadron. Uh, let's right, left, down, up. Dun, dun, dun. Start, coin, pause, dam. The fighting in this area is ferocious. I'm hit. Oh, ah, I messed up. Okay, you dead yet? You're dead. Let's check out the computers. So, you have more computers than I even know existed. It's glad to know that they exist, especially since I never really played much of the, uh, the Amiga. Let me just shoot up the Amiga here. So the thing with the computers is that it's one of those things that you really, that you have to know what you're doing more in depth because it's not as easy to figure out as the consoles and everything, especially since computers have their own little quirks. Here's the Commodore 64, as you can see here. It's got the um, standard boot screen. Uh, let's see here. We're gonna change, you could, you could change from PAL to NTSC. The quotation marks are above the two on the Commodore 64, I forgot. <laughs> Hello, mister. Easy enough. All right, so let's try the Apple IIe. I have never used an Apple IIe, uh, recently at least. We could change our displays to color, green, amber, black and white, change our aspect ratio. If ever you want to see what a Commodore 16 looked like when you first booted it up, here you go. Here's the ZX Spectrum. I have never used the ZX Spectrum, and we never will because I don't know how to do it. So, here's the Sam Cube. This came out in 1990, apparently. Okay, I'm not, I'm not familiar with this computer. Mattel Aquarius. Oh, we are in Microsoft Basic. All right. 
Lovely. Okay, back to the script. As much as I do love this device, there are some things you should keep in mind. First of all, there is a bit of setup involved. It's nothing horrible, and if you can follow directions, you won't have a problem. But you may sometimes have to tinker with settings a bit to get the best results for each core. So don't go into this expecting a plug-and-play device. Also, don't count on any fancy, friendly front ends. Everything from loading up games to changing cores is handled through the same basic menus. Really only a big deal if you were thinking of sticking it in an enclosure with limited access and wanted something more user-friendly. As far as cores go, don't expect anything from the mid-90s or beyond being playable on this board at the moment. There have been plans for a PlayStation core, perhaps even a Sega Saturn, but N64 and beyond may be outside this hardware's capabilities. If you're the type that depends on the safe states of software emulators, you'll be disappointed to know that most cores, with the exception of the Game Boy Advance, do not offer this option. Of course, if the cartridge originally supported saves, like some of those that contain batteries, it will behave in the same manner on the Mister. But really, the sticking point for many people may be the price tag. Jurassic's DE10 Nano board averages at $130. The SD RAM expansion typically runs for $60, and the additional boards are $50 each. Factor in other add-ons like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi adapters, or a nice case, and you're spending over $300. For those who are perfectly happy with the performance of their inexpensive Raspberry Pi, or any of those retro mini consoles, it might be hard to imagine them justifying the higher cost of a Mr. Setup. That said, I am beyond pleased with my investment. There's plenty of community support for the Mr. Project, and endless flexibility and expansion possibilities. And I could appreciate the promise of higher accuracy recreating the old hardware, especially as those machines aren't getting any younger. The need for accurate preservation of their design and behavior is becoming more and more important as time goes by. And that's not to mention the convenience of having everything in this small box. There's more free time simply enjoying the games without the hassles of hooking up wires and cleaning cartridge edge connectors. But I only scratched the surface here. If you stuck around this long and want to know more, I put some links for you in the description. Nothing is sponsored and no one's paying me. But with maybe a hint of hyperbole and no puns intended, this has been a game changer for me. And maybe it will be for you as well. In the meantime, this was Dave for TV Games. See you next time. Now that sucked.